So let's um, take a look today at First Peter. I was, I was thinking about where, uh, where I might go next, and it's always good to have an anchor point so that when you have opportunities to, to, to speak to the same uh, room, and as we do have the opportunity to speak as a, a staff team, from time to time, um, it's helpful to kind of have something to, to know where you're going to go and what you're going to work through. And so I was praying and just felt the Lord lead me to, to First Peter. It's actually something I've been wanting to uh, to work my way through for, for a while. And, and the more I was reading through it, the more I was thinking about it, the more I was praying about it, the more I realized that actually it's such a timely uh, part of Scripture. It's not necessarily First Peter. Uh, Christian, Christians in the West, it's not necessarily their favorite book of the Bible. I think if we were to go around and do a survey, what is your favorite book of the Bible? We'd get all sorts of different answers, clearly. Uh, and those answers could be informed by your journey with Jesus. It could be informed by just what you happen to be reading. Uh, a lot of people would say their favorite bit of the Bible is the bit that they're currently reading because it just captures your imagination, doesn't it? And God works through that section at that moment as you're engaging uh, with it. But, uh, you know, if you're academically minded, you might be kind of uh, a little more driven to, to the deep riches of uh, Romans. Uh, but then, you know, who can escape the, the Gospels? And so we all have our different kind of things that we're, we're drawn to. But in, in parts of the world where we're doing quite a lot of work with advance, where there's a lot of persecution, particularly across certain parts of Northern Africa and into uh, great swathes of, uh, of, of the wide region of Asia, if you talk to a lot of Christians in those countries, First Peter will come up uh, more often than not, actually, because it's a book in which uh, Christians who are having to figure out how to live as resident aliens, how to live as um, foreigners in a, in a foreign land at great difficulty and persecution are being addressed for encouragement. Peter is writing to a group of believers. Let's see here in verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, um, are living in Roman colonies around what is basically today mainly modern-day Turkey. And in this context that they live in, they're experiencing some quite serious hardships, but maybe not the hardships that our mind is immediately drawn to when we think about persecution in the Bible. Because when we think about pers in the, a persecution in the Bible, and when we start casting our mind to persecution of the type that an organization like Open Doors might draw our attention to of persecuted Christians around the world, our mind often will go to the most extreme ends of it, which is kind of violence or imprisonment. Yeah, But in truth, these Christians were not necessarily at this particular moment experiencing a lot of violence against them. That was actually going to come in quite a major way, and there were other parts of the world where Christians were definitely experiencing violence. But, but these Christians might get a bit of violence from time to time. They might get a bit of imprisonment, incarceration from time to time. But the main persecution they were experiencing was just the discomfort of social ostracization. They had restrictions on who they were allowed to marry. They had restrictions on what kind of work they could do. They were often treated differently in matters of taxation. Uh, they wouldn't have had any voting rights in democracy didn't exist in the way that it does today, but there were elements of civil uh, democracy and there were things that people could kind of have a say on within society. But these Christians would have had no say in any of those uh, matters and they would have received harsher punishments if they did do something wrong than the average citizen. This kind of social ostracization meant that they were in a culture that whilst not immediately uh, threatening them with being murdered and martyred for their faith was just very, 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 very uncomfortable to live in. And Peter is writing to encourage them to endure in their sufferings. But how do you endure in your sufferings? There's only one way. You endure in your suffering in light of your salvation. And that's a big theme that Peter continually calls people back to. What does it mean to be the redeemed people of God? To be saved, to be grafted in to Israel, to be adopted into the family of God. He's going to get into all of that. We're not going to deal with it today just looking at these first two verses, but we're going to touch on it lightly with what Peter will eventually unpack in quite a lot of depths. But it's not just suffering in light of salvation. It's in light of your suffering through salvation and enduring what does it then mean to be present as the people of God in society? What does it mean to be the church who are a light into the darkness, to live as witnesses of good news, a holy church in a hostile environment? Now, to be in the world, but not 
of the world is actually a challenge before all believers in Jesus Christ. How do we live within and engage with secular society if we do it at all? Christians have had different approaches to that throughout history. Some choose what we call separatism. You might think of the, uh, the Amish and the Mennonites, kind of the sections of the Anabaptist church who have removed themselves from society so that they don't actually need to be in the world, and then they won't certainly be of the world. But the problem with being separatist is how will the presence of God be revealed if his presence carriers are not amongst the world? Some choose societal integration. Okay, we're going to try and integrate and bring the hope of the gospel through our integration. But if you'll excuse the slight pun, the challenge with integration is that it all too easily becomes syntegration. I know it's cheesy, but you'll remember it. Syntegration is so often the next step of integration because it's very, very difficult for us to be surrounded by a hostile culture that is so persuasive in its influence and still remains holy. Some choose to be present denouncers. So present but repeatedly speaking denouncement into the culture. That's wrong. That's evil. That's out of order. And trying to look different by the way that we denounce what is going on in the culture around us. Other choose presence in the world but coldness. So we're there. We're amongst the people but we're very cool and cold and indifferent to what's going on around us. What is the right course of uh, action for us as believers? Well, the truth is Our motivation in asking this question will determine our answer to it. Our motivation in asking the question, how do I live as a holy person in a hostile world? Or the more simplistic version of it, which I think most people are kind of considering, which is how do I just be in the world but not be of the world as the Bible asks us to be, is really going to be determined by how you enter into that question. That will determine your exit from the question. If you go into the question with, mm, how can I be in this world and get maximum benefit but with minimum cost? You're going to end up in a bad place. But unfortunately, that's where a lot of us do end up. We think, okay, I want to be present in the world. I kind of have to be. I can't just separate, separate myself out from it. So how am I going to be in the world but not of the world by getting maximum benefit from being there but with minimum cost? The maximum benefit part is not the problem if we understand it as being God's benefit, not ours. But the minimum cost part is a big problem because we will never achieve God's purposes in the world if we are not willing to make the same sacrifice that he himself has, death to self, denial of self, and complete submission to his spirit. But if we go into the question with this mindset, how can I glorify God for his maximum benefit, no matter what the cost is? We won't just think about what it is to be holy in a hostile culture. We will think about what it means to be holy amongst a hostile culture, What is the difference? One means that we are rooted in it. We don't want to be rooted in it. We'll be rooted in God. The other is that we're just amongst. A subtle distinction, but it's an important one. And when we start thinking about what Peter is writing to these early believers here, we'll see very quickly why this distinction is important. One thing that just came up recently was this furore around the Olympics opening ceremony. I don't know if you guys saw that. I don't know if you guys engaged with that in Anyway, but there was a lot of uh, stuff around social media, around the opening ceremony of the Olympics, having at one point a bit of a kind of visual tableau of, of um, Leonardo da Vinci's uh, Last Supper painting re-represented through a, what was at the time a fashion show. It was largely made up of, uh, of, of drag queens and uh, pretty, pretty garish in its, in, in its expression in many ways. Um, and... As that image was presented in in kind of the same visual representation as da Vinci's painting, some people missed it, didn't even recognize that uh, allusion to the painting. Some people recognized it and were deeply, deeply offended and outraged. And some people recognized it and, uh, and, and didn't think that it warranted too much comment. I don't know where you landed on that, but it was interesting for me to see that it raised the issue again. What does it actually mean? for us to remain holy in a, in a culture that is either definitively and directly hostile or the perception is at least that it may be hostile towards us. Well, Peter here gives us the most incredible greeting to his letter that is rooted in the identity of God. Because what he says is, he says, look, first of all, you guys are God's chosen people. You're, you're the chosen people, but you're scattered around 
the world. You're not rooted in God's chosen land for you. You're scattered away from the center. And so you've got to understand that life is going to be a little tricky for you. So I want to write to you and encourage you and affirm you that even though you're scattered around these Roman ruled areas of oppression and persecution, do not forget that you are still God's chosen people. And who is God? This is who God is. Verse 2. We have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Did you catch that there? The full identity of God. It's one of the most trying passages in Scripture. If anybody ever says, oh, the the Trinity is not really present in Scripture, this is a great verse to point them in the direction of. Right here, the Trinity is revealed and represented as the full authority of who God is. And if we understand who God is, we have hope of understanding who we are. And if we understand who we are in light of who God is, guess what? We have the hope of not just surviving, in this fallen world, but thriving for the glory of God and that the world would see the hope of who he is. So the first thing that he draws attention to here that will help us to navigate through a potentially hostile world, I don't think the world is always hostile, but there are times when it definitely stings, is that first of all, we are God's people by the unique grace of the Father. And this is unique. Look what he says. We have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. You know what that word foreknowledge means here? The, significant is, uh, the significance of this word is actually deeply profound. It doesn't just mean that God always knew. Sometimes we think about God always knowing something and it somehow becomes discompassionate. It doesn't just mean that God always knew. It means that God always cared. It means that God has always been concerned about you throughout eternity. That's what his foreknowledge means because he's a God of love who is postured in loving response and affection towards you. So if in his foreknowledge we are his chosen people, that means he has always cared about us. Only the heavenly father is consistent in this kind of love. Man, I want to love my wife well, but the truth is we have bad days. I want to love my little girl well. The truth is, it's a challenge sometimes, even though your posture is, yes, I love you. Of course I love you. I'd do anything for you. I'm still a bit fleshy, and I still have days when I'm not as consistent as I would like to be in my love response to what I'm feeling, that it also matches up with what I'm doing. But God is totally consistent. He does not change. And he already said it. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, and perfectly consistent in his loving posture towards us and we have been chosen by him which begs the question why is it then that we are so obsessed with fitting into a world that is anything but consistent in its affection for us we, we get so concerned with being accepted by the world you know some of my favorite testimonies I mean testimony is just powerful whatever the story when God comes in and makes a change it's glorious and it's wonderful and we love hearing people being set free from from addictions and backgrounds where, that are very demonstrably and obviously offensive and chaotic in the, in the world. Wow, what power. But I've got to say, some of my absolute favorite testimonies are people who didn't know that it was possible for them to have value. And they were so desperate to attempt to get value if it was possible that they would do anything in the world's eyes to receive it. Now, that might turn into some of those behaviors I already mentioned, drugs and crime and gangsterism, whatever it might be. But sometimes it plays out in more subtle ways. But I love hearing testimonies of people who actually say, you know what, since I met Jesus, I realized that I don't need to live for anybody's approval or affirmation or affection, but his, and he freely gives it through Jesus Christ. That is so powerful. And I think we get so used to hearing that message and living in that message that we don't realize just how potent that message is to the world who is desperately striving to do anything they can do to be accepted and valued and cherished and seen and known and loved we gotta be uh, we gotta move away from being afraid of looking odd and weird like we need to just embrace the weirdness as Christians you know something really interesting is happening amongst Gen Z that more and more Gen Zers that are coming into relationship with Jesus Christ are starting to root themselves 
in more historically, uh, aesthetically looking churches. That is to say, Church of England, the Catholic Church, churches that still do quite strange things, where people still, the clergy still wear the frocks, and they still, maybe some smells and bells, and the processions are quite organized, and the creedal statements are quite, you know, there's maybe a little less spontaneity, although I wouldn't want to hardline on that, because there can be much openness to the Spirit of God in those communities. I've seen it. But, but there's a little bit more organization. There's a little bit more weirdness in what's going on. And people are drawn to this. Why? Because more and more and more the world is seeing the bankruptcy and the temporalness of what's around them. Think about social media. The new fad is here. And then it's gone. We've moved on to the next thing. Seems like only five minutes ago that Facebook was the game in town. And now Facebook is for people of my age. And then the younger people have moved on to TikTok. The next thing will be along in, in no time. And, and we're, we're finding it hard to build our lives on these wishy-washy shifting foundations. But we sense that we might be able to find some value and some love in those things. But we, we attempt to put deep roots into things that do not have the depth of soil to let those roots grow and flourish. And actually, we hit the bottom pretty quick. And guess what? After a while, the soil goes away completely and we are left rootless and subject to the whim and fancy of the next blowing wind of culture that comes along. But we have something rooted in history. We have something that the world might look at and think, this is a bit weird. Good. It should look weird. Because if they totally get it from day one, we're probably not doing something right. Because if they totally get it from day one, why have they not already received it? Why are they not already living in it? Why are they not embracing Jesus with both hands? We've become so obsessed with the affirmation of the world within our attractional church models even, with good intention, I might suggest, initially, But as the old saying goes, the road to hell is paved with good intention. That somewhere in the mix, we become more interested in giving the world something of what we think that they would find attractive, that we've misunderstood that the most attractive thing that we can give to the world is authenticity, truth. And the best way to reveal that in the fact that the church is weird. It's just weird. It doesn't look like anything else in the world. If it looks like anything else in the world, we're in trouble because we don't have anything to offer. It's not potent. But we are God's chosen people by the unique grace of the Father. We can embrace the weirdness in our culture. The second thing is, he says that we are God's people by the unique power of the Spirit. He says, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, we become the unique people of God into the world. And only the Spirit, only the Spirit can help us to live as a holy people in a hostile world. Now, if you want a good hostility checklist to work through when you're facing a period of persecution or something in culture that gets your offense radar up and running, or there's something going on where you're like, I feel aggrieved, I feel vulnerable, I feel like maybe I need to speak into this, I've got to act in some way, or I've got to retreat in some way. Whatever the compulsion may be, what is our guide going to be to help us navigate this well and be in the world, but not of the world. Be distinctive rather than distracted or discouraged or diverted. Well, Paul actually gives us an amazing hostility checklist in Galatians 5 that's rooted in the only power that we have to overcome, the Holy Spirit. Because he says that we're a spirit-filled people that yield spirit fruit. And the spirit fruit that pours out of our lives, which is the most identifiable factor of us actually being the redeemed, unique people of God, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, these things work for us as a little checklist. How am I going to respond in the cultural moment that I'm in? Love. In this cultural moment, how do I reveal the love of God in this moment? Joy. How do I maintain the joy of my salvation? in this season. Peace. When all is said and done, how does the peace of God remain in this situation? Patience. How do I keep my perspective in this? Kindness. How do I reveal the kindness of God? Which scripture tells us the kindness of God is intended to lead to what? Repentance. It's not just a wishy-washy thing. Oh, let's be kind because it's a nice thing. No, the kindness of God revealed to his people has a direct purpose that it would be holy and unique. It won't look like the kindness that anybody else can offer because it will draw people to repentance. Distinctive. Goodness. How do I respond to evil with good? Peter will go on to say in this magnificent letter, don't repay evil for evil, but repay evil with blessing. Or to use the word here, good. 
faithfulness. How do I please God in this? That's such an important one. The Bible says it's impossible to please God without faith. We repay to him what he is perfect in, his own faithfulness to us. That even, Paul writes to Timothy, when God is Un, uh, even when we are unfaithful, God remains faithful for he cannot change who he is. He will not change who he is. So how do we move forward in faith? The one thing that we need to please God that will then help us to be pleasing as a worship offering into the world. Gentleness, how do I stay humble in this? Self-discipline or control, how do I stay off social media in this? Slight joke, but for many of us, it's a big problem. Big problem. First instinct, run social media, let everybody know what you think about it. Well, you might want to let people know what you think about it when it's been considered and prayed through and you feel that a response is necessary. But have you run through a checklist? Because the answer to how to respond to hostility in the world has been and always will be in the power of the Holy Spirit. And third, we are God's people by the unique blood of Jesus. Peter writes to be, that we are to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood using that imagery and we find throughout scripture very potently in in exodus and clearly pointing to the reality of jesus blood setting us free washing us clean but it's not just the idea of being washed from our sinfulness which we need to be the redeemed people it is also in the sprinkling of the blood about holiness it's about the idea of being set apart you are set apart and cleaned up by god to be his people into the world only jesus can save us Uh, Only the Father can truly love us, and so we respond to his love. Only the Spirit can truly empower us, and so we welcome him. And only Jesus can truly save us, and so we are obedient exclusively to him. The world is deceived. Don't forget that. I think we're very quick to forget that. The world is deceived. There is a way of salvation for them by God's grace, but they do not see it. Why do we keep expecting them? It shocks me at times. I don't want to be critical. I certainly don't want a soapbox. The pulpit is not a place for soapbox. It's just a place for the word of God. But it is important that we do comment on on culture and what's going on around so that we know how to live effectively in in the world that we're in. But but please hear my heart in this. I say this with with humility and hopeful, some semblance of gentleness. But but we've got to be clear about this. It, It does surprise me sometimes how we expect the world to behave in a way that they're never going to behave because they're deceived. And when they do things against us, we're surprised and outraged by it. And I'm like, what What did you expect them to do? Like, they're blind. They're deceived just as we were. And the posture so quickly becomes outrage. But it doesn't serve any purpose. In fact, worse still, it probably serves the enemy's purpose more than the kingdom's purpose. We take the bait very often. i got a friend who... Loves every time I see him. It's, no, it's actually nobody in this room, even though there's a lot of Man United fans in this room, who also who loves to refer to United whenever I talk to him about it because he knows it annoys me because I support Leeds United, but obviously Man United are the United. So, and the first time we ever did it, he was like, hey, you know, I'm going to see United this week. And oh, are you going to Ellen Road to watch Leeds? And he went, ha ha, you took the bait because he knew what he was doing. We so easily take the bait of the world, whether they're offering intentionally or subconsciously. We don't need to take the bait. We have the blessing. So why don't we offer the blessing in response? The Olympics ceremony. You know, I looked at that and I just thought to myself, man, we have a great opportunity here. The, the world has just seen, whether they, for those that recognized it, the world has just seen a bit of a representation of the Last Supper. It's a very distorted, confused representation of the Last Supper, but that's what they were pulling from. By the way, you remember what I was saying about historical tradition and people wanting to be rooted in historical tradition? What do you think they're doing? with their ideology. What are they doing? They're trying to root it in something. They're trying to give it power. They're trying to subvert what we have that we know is powerful so that they can tap into its power and use it for their own purpose. It makes sense when you think about it, but it's just utterly misguided. But rather than being outraged or offended by it, the posture should just be to see the opportunity and go, wow, the world has just laid eyes on a visual representation of the Last Supper, very distorted. So let's see if we can start to make it a little clearer for them. I didn't see one Christian, myself included, so it's a rebuke to me as much as anybody else. I haven't seen one Christian post the two images that have been going around, largely connected with outrage, the, uh, the, the Olympics one at the top and the, and the, uh, the original Da Vinci painting underneath, saying, um, hey, look at this. Isn't it so interesting that the Olympics featured uh, 
a, an image of the Last Supper. Do you know why the Last Supper is so powerful? People didn't do that. What they did was it's disgusting. It's a disgusting attack on Christianity. I get it, you're hurt. I get it, it does sting. We love Jesus so much, we hate it. When it feels like he might be being mocked, we hate it. But do you know what? He's been on the cross. There is no shame that the world can bring against Jesus that has not already horrifically been outworked on the cross. None. There is nothing that the world can say or do that would be worse than the cross. And he already took it. And guess what? By his own choice for you and me and for them. We don't, God doesn't need our offense. It's no use to him. He needs our obedience. He doesn't need it, actually. He just desires it so that through our obedience we'll be blessed and we'll be able to worship him like the people we were created to be. I humbly suggest that if we are outraged by drag queens being lined up to look like a Renaissance painting, we might want to re-familiarize ourselves with the crucifixion. There's no scandal the world can bring on Jesus that hasn't already come through that cross. Rather than being outrageous, actually, and shocking, do you know what it is? It's boring. Boring. Because it's the same old, same old that's happened throughout here. There's nothing new. So why are we getting... ah! Instead, we should look at it and go, wow, how sad the world is deceived. But we have the way to help them see. Because we were once blind, but we now see. Outrage is for the weak in spirit. Obedience is for the faithful. Choose opportunity over offense. Grace over grievance. Prayer is better than posting, my friends. Bring clarity in the chaos. And remember, the enemy's schemes always backfire. However they play out. The enemy schemes always backfire because God wins. And what does God's victory lead to? Peter tells these Christians as he begins to encourage them to live as holy people in a hostile world. It leads to grace and peace, which are ours in abundance. But the world does not have it, my friends. So let's take it to them as a holy people in a hostile world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are everything that we need. Lord, it does grieve us at times when we see your name being ridiculed, imagery that uh, attempts to make a mockery of you, Lord. It hurts us because we love you so much. It's understandable that we would feel that pain and want to even be offended by it. But Lord, would you give us by your Spirit's power, through our unique identity as your Heavenly Father chosen people, By your blood, Lord, and obedience to you, would you give us instead the better posture of just obedience to be in your gracious people who show the world that there is hope and indeed his name is Jesus Christ.